Hi there. I'm going to be reading um, chapter two of Bubble. So if you haven't watched the first video of chapter one, I suggest doing that. We are following a story of 11-year-old Joe who has a condition where he cannot leave his hospital room. So um, again, if you want to like, close your eyes and picture visualizing um, and what's going on in the story while I'm reading, um, I'm just all snuggled up in bed. So I am going to read and let's see what's happening with Joe. Chapter 2. 11 years, 2 months, and 22 days. Greg is standing by the monitors when I wake up the next morning. Heart rate, 79. Body temp, 37.3 degrees Celsius. Room temp, 18 degrees Celsius. Humidity, 7%. Air purity, 98%. All right, mate, he says. Let's get this done. He leans over me and wraps a blood pressure cuff around my arm. Okay? I nod. He presses a button and the cuff inflates like a balloon. My arm throbs like it's being blown up, too. Greg looks at the reading. 130 over 85, he says. That's okay. Well, it's not bad, he says. Maybe a little bit high. We'll just keep an eye on it. He types all the readings into his tablet while I check my pajamas to see if there's any more blood that came in through the night. I'm clean except for some dried blood on my fingers and a water red stain on my sleeve. Greg slowly raises his blinds for a moment. He stands where he is, his head tilted like he spotted something interesting on the street below. I ask him what he sees. Nothing much, mate, he says. Just some workmen getting ready to dig up the road. I lift my legs up off the bed. You don't have to get up yet, mate. I want to, I say. It feels like I've been laying here for ages. I put my hand in my bed to help me keep my balance, then walk over to the window. There's not much to see, mate, but they're right down there. Greg points to the end of the street. I see two bl blue vans and four men wearing orange jackets. Two of them are s setting up traffic lights. The other two are getting shovels and drills out of the van. I'd like to stay and watch them for a while, but my legs are beginning to ache. I turn and walk around the bathroom, past my poster of Thor holding up a bridge with one hand. I wish I was as strong as him today, but even superheroes have to rest, Greg says. Even Spider-Man can't be out saving the world all the time. I take off my pajamas and get in the shower. I hear Greg sliding a chair across the floor. He'll sit outside and check if I'm okay. I press the water button, then another for soap. The water is 34 degrees. The soap smells of nothing. While I wash, Greg shouts to me. He tells me about his girlfriend, Katie, that she's been working late every night this week, and he's been looking forward to seeing her. There's football on TV, but he doesn't think he should watch it. But it's Man United, I shout back. And she's my girlfriend, he laughs and starts talking again as I put soap on my arm and on my legs then wash it off. I stop the water, check my skin for new bruises, but only find old ones. Two on my left shin from where I knocked against the radiator last week. I wish they would go away like dirt. Greg's st still talking about football. I lift up my arm, wash underneath, then at my side of my body. I lift my other arm and do the same. I feel a bump half halfway down my ribs. I run my hand over it again. It doesn't hurt, but I know it's there. I turn the water off, check again, shout to Greg. He comes in, opens the shower door. You okay? He hands me a towel. I wrap it around my waist. I found one, I say. Have you? Show me. I lift my arm. Greg narrows his eyes, bends down, then gently presses his fingers against my ribs. Must have gotten it when you fell yesterday. Against the monitor? Greg nods and presses the bruise again. Do you think it's okay? Greg makes a mmm sound. Yeah, he says. Pretty sure. It's more brown than purple. I look, look up again. Count how many ribs that cover the bruise. Greg looks up at me and ruffles my hair. Hey, mate, it'll be fine. I smile, but I know the doctors will want to check. He leaves me to get dressed. When I'm done, I find Greg standing in my room, checking the monitors and making notes. I sit in my chair with my laptop, look for messages on Facebook and Skype, and wait for the doctors to come in. It's 9.32 a.m. When they arrive, Dr. Moore and Dr. Hewson. They say, good morning, ask me how I'm feeling, and I tell them okay, and they check the charts. Dr. Moore points to the traces of the line across the graph with his finger. Dr. Hewson nods, and they whisper something I can't quite hear. Dr. Moore looks over the top of his glasses. You sure you're okay? Yes, I say, but then Greg gives me a look, so I tell him about my nosebleed and the bruise under my arm. They look at Greg's notes, then up my nose, and I wince when Dr. Houston looks at my bruise and presses too hard. Sorry, he says. It's just a mild contusion, I say, the type you get when you fall off a ladder or off a curb, but not the type you get from getting hit by a car. Dr. Moore smiles and shakes his head. A mild contusion, Dr. Houston? Dr. Houston nods. Then a mild contusion it is, young man. Dr. Moore ruffles my hair. Maybe we should all just read Wikipedia instead of studying at the university for half of our lives. He grins, then he walks to the monitor and tells Greg to keep the temperature constant. Greg points to the air purity figure. It's already gone down to 97.5. 
They talk about the filter, filters and the particles and maybe that they should increase the cleaning or reduce the number of visitors. Maybe we should, says Dr. Moore, and maybe postpone the television people. Just for a day or two, Joe. It's not just that. We have to work on what's going on inside of you at the moment. But I feel okay. Dr. Moore bites his lips and look at the chart again. Joe, it's the third nosebleed in eight days. I nod. I know that. I don't need a chart to count. Yesterday, then three days ago, and the four days before that. It's the third one since they started the new treatment. They're trying a new drug to keep my white blood cells up. If it works, it won't cure me, but it'll help stop my body from getting so many infections, and I won't have to do so many blood transfusions. I hate blood transfusions. It's when they give me new blood. It doesn't hurt, but it makes me feel sick the day after that. Dr. Moore takes a deep breath. More blood tests? Yes, I think so, Joe, just to be safe. He tells Dr. Hewson to arrange him for a test tomorrow morning. Then he presses some buttons on the monitor, and they walk back toward the door. They say goodbye and tell me they'll see me soon. I look at my bed. Greg sits back down beside me. Hey, mate, it's just for a day, but I love it when the TV people come. I know, mate. Let's see how it goes. I look back at the monitors. I wish I could change the numbers with my mind. Make the air purity go up. Make my temperature go down. Keep my heartbeat constant, but I can't control them. My body does that. Not very well, though. Does it mean Beth can't come either, I ask? Of course she can. I lay on my bed, hear my breath, and in the distance I can hear the low buzz of the workmen drills outside. Greg stays with me for ten minutes until his shift ends and the day new nurse new day nurse arrives. The new nurse started yesterday. He doesn't talk much. All I know is that his name is Amir and that he comes to England from India. I only know that because it's what Greg told me, and he only knows that because it's what Amir told him. Greg gets up to say hello. When Amir comes in and Amir and says hello back, but his words are muffled behind his mask. Greg shows him where the stuff is, asks him if he has any questions. Amir shakes his head and mumbles that he's okay. Greg holds his arm and out and shrugs behind Amir's back. I want to laugh, but I can't because Amir's looking right at me. Greg slides out of the door. I wait for Amir to say something, but he doesn't. He just walks around my room, slides the chair back into the corner, ties the string on the blinds, smooths his hand over the monitor, then presses his finger against the red light for a moment. It glows bright. I want to tell him he looks like E.T., but it's hard to talk to strangers. It's easier if they talk to me first. People who come in from the outside have things that they can say. They can tell me about what they did last night, what time they got up, why they're unhappy, why they missed the bus. I can't tell them what I did yesterday because it was the same as the day before and the day before that. I could tell him that I don't have anything interesting to say, but you're not supposed to start a conversation like that. And it's even harder to tell people who wear a mask because I can't tell what they're thinking as easily. Some of the new people wear them when they first start. They say it's to stop me from catching things, but when they leave after a few days, I think it's because they are more scared of catching things off of me. Finally, Amir walks over to the window and stops. He looks across the gray building opposite, then up at the sky. A plane flies across, and he turns his head and watches it fly. Then he turns his head back to where the plane came from. We're on a flight path, I say. Amir jumps and looks at me with his eyes bulging above his mask. We're on a blank path from Heathrow. He doesn't say anything. He just looks at the planes in the sky. He's only It's only been a day, but maybe he's already wishing he was with them instead of being stuck in here with me. I look up at the clock. It's nearly 11 a.m. I flip up the lid of my laptop. I've got a science lesson in the morning. Look at the screen, then glance over the top. Amir sighs, walks away from the window, and then stops by the door. You let me know if you need anything, he says. Okay. He opens the door, and the second he's gone. I wish the people didn't change so often. It's like they only stay until I get to know them, and then they move somewhere else, and then new people come in and I have to start all over again. I click on my laptop and start my lesson with Sarah. Sarah is my science teacher. She has brown hair, brown eyes, and wears a blue cardigan. I don't know if she has any legs, but I do know that when she says my name, the J sounds like a D and the O sounds like an E, so she calls me Drew, not Joe. Sarah doesn't talk to me about TV, football, or the weather. All she talks to me about is science. It's the only way I can learn without the risk of people bringing me infections. Sometimes she is there for real and we can talk, but today I think she has maybe gone on a holiday because she's left a video of her to click on. I have to do this lesson for two hours every week. I don't get holidays the same time as other kids because if I miss school when I'm doing poorly. Today's lesson is about... Risa resonance resonance i click on sarah's picture the screen changes to a diagram of two boxes side by side with two wires inside i close my eyes open them again it's only been a few seconds but i already feel like yawning 
I look at my browser, think of going on YouTube, maybe Spotify. It's not like Sarah's here to check if I've done it. I fast forward. A box comes up of sound waves beating down from a boat to the bottom of the ocean. I go to click on the boat, but the Skype icon at the bottom starts splashing. I click on it. Hi, Joe. I smile. Hi, Henry. What are you doing? The pencil scribbles on the screen. Stuck in a bubble. You? Stuck in a bubble. Huh. You doing much today? Learning physics from a cartoon, waiting for bath. Are you going out of your room? No, too hot. The cooling system broke down yesterday. Huh. I fried. I smile again and feel warm inside. Want to go to screen? Henry makes me... Feels more like a real friend to me when I can actually see him. Sure, they're digging up the road outside. Show me. We switch to video. Henry's smiling face fills the screen and we wave. I take my laptop over to the road and tilt it to the camera to pointing down the road. I show Henry the roadwalks, the yellow diggers, the traffic lights, and I pan it across the screen or the street to show him people walking in the rain past the shop fronts, then the buildings above, the big tall windows, one stacked up upon the no another, and then I show him the gutters of the roofs and stop by the building opposite and tell him that that's where the man in the gray coveralls comes out to slit pigeons' throats. Wait until he comes out again, he says. I can't see him. Maybe he's having a cup of tea. Show me tomorrow, then. I move the camera on. More rooftop, more shop, more doorways, more people walking in the rain. See, nothing much happens. Want to see out my window? Sure. The screen goes white. Henry, I say, don't point the camera at the sun. Oops, sorry. He angles the camera down. I see a big red brick building sticking up into the sky and a park and a cemetery with white headstones that stretch out for miles. Henry told me it's called Clark Park. Children play football and baseball there. The cemetery is called Woodlands. Henry thinks people go straight from the hospital to the morgue. The camera starts to shake. Henry, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Just walking to the other window, he turns the camera. I see his blonde hair and his smiling face. He's always so happy to show me around. He gets out of the way and I see more red buildings, cars and buses going down the straight roads, stopping at the lights, and in the distance I see a ferry crossing a river. It's the Shullykill River that splits the city in half. Then he sits down in his bed. It only takes us ten minutes to do our window tours. He tells me he thinks London looks great today. I tell him his streets look more interesting than mine. He laughs and tells me it's boring, that I only like America because it looks exciting on films. I hear a door click open. Henry looks up over the top of his screen. Hey, Brett's here. He turns his screen. Brett is Henry's favorite nurse. He's tall and skinny. He's got spiky hair like Bart Simpson. He bends down and waves at me. Hey, dude, he says. How are you doing? I'm okay, I say. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Sorry I've got to check on this guide and give him some meds. It's okay. I'm going to go, Henry. Catch you later. I close my laptop. I like chatting with Brett, but I hate seeing the needles. Brett says it's psychological and that I'm hyper-empathetic. It's just a complicated way of saying that whatever they stick a needle in Henry, it feels like it's going into me. I don't know when it started to happen, only that it did. Henry is my best friend. He's American and he lives in a hospital in Philadelphia where his doctors think he has the same condition as me. Or maybe I have the same condition as him because he's three years older than me, so he's been trapped in his bubble three years longer than I've been trapped in mine. But Henry might be going outside. Not forever, just for an hour or so. A scientist from NASA has made him a spacesuit with a special lightweight oxygen tank. So far, he's only worn it to his room, but yesterday they let him take it to the end of the corridor. It sounds like they've still got technical problems, but I think Henry will be going outside soon. I wish I was too. I wish I could go outside and walk at the people down the street. They might just be going to work, but I'd love to walk with them in the sun or in, a, in the rain. I'd like to talk to them without worrying that I might die every time I take a breath. I'd like to go to the park and kick a ball and throw a frisbee for a dog. I've never been to a park, and the only time I've ever seen a dog is on TV. Henry hasn't seen one either. He said he saw a cat outside his window once, but I think he must have been dreaming because his window is 200 feet up in the air. When I was nine, I dreamt the doctors were going to fly me over to visit him. I told Henry, and we planned what we would do if we were to hang out. He would bring Madden NFL 13, and I would get FIFA 13, and then we would watch old films. Henry wanted to watch Terminator, and he would bring all four of them, and we'd stay up all night and drink our glucose drinks and play music. But the director of his hospital said he wouldn't let that do that, do that in real life. He said it wasn't practical or safe for either of us to travel 10 miles in a car, let alone 3,000 on a plane, so we just used Skype instead. I closed down my laptop and think of him in his room. His doctors are trying something new, too. They're injecting it with something called ampho amphotericin B to fight off fungal infections. If it works for him, then maybe it'll work for me too. Last year, they gave him an extra vitamin D because he was sweating lots and his bones were aching. 
It made him hallucinate and be really thirsty. Two weeks later, they tried the same with me. It made me dizzy and sick. It made me think that maybe me and Henry don't have the same thing after all. We just live in the same kind of place. I hear a buzz by my side and pick up my phone. There's a picture of Beth on the screen and a message. She says she's been sorry, but she has an assignment to finish, so she won't be able to make it until, to me until 5. I tell her it's okay. Pick up the remote and turn on the TV. The news headlines are on. There's a pic picture of big tanks with soldiers marching beside them somewhere in Russia. Another picture of a plane and a map of the Indian Ocean. And a photograph of a boy who's raised a million pounds for cancer just by posting things on Twitter. Then there's a weather map of Britain saying it's 34 degrees Celsius outside. I changed the DVD remote to watch Avengers Assemble. It's the third time I've seen it, even though Beth has only brought it for me last week. She's always buying DVDs for me. Once I asked her how she could afford them all, she said they weren't expensive and sometimes she borrows them from her friends, but she just never takes them back. I really love Beth. She's the only relative I have left who can visit me since mom and dad died. Halfway through the film, my head begins to ache and my eyelids begin to drop. I turn the sound down and close my eyes, hear people screaming, things crashing, and Thor shouting. My head feels light, and I can't feel my legs and my feet. Buildings rise out of the dark, and they're on fire. The streets are filled with cars, and they're crashing into one another. People are running and yelling, and I'm running with them. Webs are jets, webs are jets. Jets are quicker, but webs are cooler, but I'm a superhero. I'm here to save people, and to have fun. I press a button on my chest, and flames shoot from my feet. A car flies through the air toward me. I stop it with the hand and put it gently back down on the car road. Another car, a flying lamppost. Three children are standing underneath it. I flick my wrists and press two fingers into my palm. Then the webs wrap around them and pull them out of the way. I hear a rumble and look up. A building is tumbling down above me. The people are running and screaming between flying pieces of metal and concrete. I try to run with them, but the asphalt is cracking underneath the earth's core. More metal, more concrete. I run through it all, protecting myself with Thor's hammer. I can protect anyone and anything. I'm Spider-Man, Thor, and Iron Man. I'm all the superheroes rolled into one. Gotta go. There's a man on a ledge whose clothes are on fire. I engine jets and fly up into the sky. The TV screen is blank when I wake up. There's a glass of water and a silver packet of food beside the table. The clock says 7.50. I turn my head. Beth is in the chair beside me. She pulls out her earphones out of her ears. Must be tiring saving the planet. How did you know? She nods at my sheets all crumpled to the end of my bed. Well, it was either that or you were having a great game of football. Beth puts her hands on my arm. You okay? I nod. Yeah, it's just too quiet today. She rubs my arm. Are you still tired? I smile, even though I don't feel like it. I take deep breaths. Another blood test tomorrow, I say. I know. Dr. Moore called me. Don't worry. The TV people might not come. She rubs my arm again. But let's just wait and see. Hey, I've got something for you. She reaches down by my side and hands me a plastic bag. I pull out a new Arsenal shirt, a t-shirt with a picture of Spider-Man hanging upside down, and a pair of new pajamas. Thanks, I say. Sorry I keep getting blood on them. It's okay. It's not like you can help it. I take off my t-shirt and pull the Spider-Man one over my head. Beth reaches out and fluffs up my hair. It looks great, she says. I brush my hand over my t-shirt. The cotton presses against my skin. Spidey has already been washed and sterilized before I got to wear him. That's what happens to all my clothes. Me and Beth usually pick them up together online. She'll send me pictures of things when she's out shopping. I like to pick up my own clothes, especially my sneakers. Beth takes a deep breath. So, what's the new nurse like? I shrug. I don't know. He doesn't say much. He just moves things around and then watches the planes. Beth laughs. Maybe he wishes he's on vacation. Maybe he's just wishing he could escape the bubble. Beth sort of smiles, then rests her head on my hands, and her hair falls down to the side of her face and covers the little scar on her cheek. My laptop makes a dilute sound beside me. I look at the clock. It's 8 o'clock at night in London. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Philadelphia. Henry is waiting to talk to me already. Another beep. Beth tells me I can talk with him if I want. I tell her I'd rather talk with her. She smiles. Okay, she says. Tell me what else you've done today, apart from saving the planet and watching the nurse watch planes. I shrug. I learned what resonance means. Really? What is it? I think you know. I don't. Tell me. I tell her about the two boxes with wires in them, that when you touch one, it makes noise, and the other one, and the other box does the same thing. She nods like she understands. So you know? No, she says, but I think that's what Paul told me about what happens with guitars. She bites her lip and looks back at the ground. It's okay. You can talk about other people outside. She smiles and stands up. But you're not going. Now, though, I feel a little bit panicked. No, you idiot. Slide over. She sits on my bed and puts her arm around me. I pick up the remote, turn on the TV, and flick through the channels. I feel Beth's body moves as she breathes. 
You can bring him to visit me if you want. Maybe I will, she says, putting her hand on top of my head. I flip to another channel. I don't think she'll bring him, though. John was the last one to come here. He'd been going out with Beth for two months. I liked him. I think he liked me. But two weeks after he visited, Beth told me that he had left. She said that they had been arguing and that she couldn't finish her assignments because of it. I wonder if it's because she spends all of her time visiting me. My laptop beeps again. He's getting impatient, she squeezes. Go on, talk to him. I don't mind. I reach over. Hey, Joe, what are you doing? Stuck in a bubble. You? Stuck in a bubble. Beth laughs, then lies against the pillow. Go to screen? I go to screen, but all I can see is a blurry pink, and I can hear an echo of Henry laughing. He pulls his finger away from the lens and leaves it stuck up at me. I do the same thing back. I turn the laptop toward Beth. Hello, Henry, she waves. Hello, Beth. Henry waves back. Henry's room is bigger than mine. He's got a sofa and a TV area and another table by a window where he can sit and eat. He says it's like a penthouse and that if he lives there long enough, he might take over the whole top floor and have a 360-degree view of Philadelphia. He'll be able to see the Comcast Center, Liberty Place, and City Hall. And on clear days, he should be even able to see the Philadelphia Eagles play. Henry puts his face close up to the screen. So what are you going to do? Just stare at me? I smile, switch to text so I can message him and talk to Beth at the same time. It's great that he's my friend, even though he lives inside of his computer. Okay, so that was the end of chapter two. Tomorrow I will upload chapter three. Um, after we finish that, I kind of want you guys to think about maybe what it would be like to be Joe or what it would be like to be Henry and if you're kind of feeling like you're in a bubble right now. So if you have any writing time scheduled in your day, maybe like kind of write about what you would feel like if you were Joe or how you can relate or maybe how you could be a good friend to someone like Joe. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow.